Trading Nut, episode 41. Another key driving factor of price is the level of desperation, which is reflected in the spread. The market's going to do something. Your job is not to fight it. The market never, ever runs away. It's always there. That personal diary of trading will make you a much better trader than... I could be right about the direction, but wrong about the trade. Don't focus on the monetary side. Trying to make too much money on a trade is what I have seen killed every trader. Your losses offer you some of the greatest insight you can find into your mistakes. Relax. Learn the process. Candlestick pattern trading is a freaking trap. Don't be in a rush to become a millionaire. Let the market tell you what the market wants to tell you. This podcast is not financial trading or investing advice of any kind. What's up, traders? Welcome to another installment of the Trading Up podcast. I'm your host, Cam Hawkins, and today we've got an oldie but a goodie. In actual fact, it's a, it's an old guest who we recorded the show back in 2015, so almost four years ago now, or was it August 2015? I can't believe it's been that long. Well, almost four years ago we recorded the show. Now, it was an, it's actually the second lost episode. So this is the only other episode of the 52 Traders podcast, which isn't really that accessible at the moment. I know a few people, like a very few people have got um, access to this. Now, it's, it's a bonus episode that I released, and it was a, a follow-up from the first interview that we did with Hishu Han, who's a trader from Singapore. Uh, this guy did some phenomenal stuff. I saw I went through a three-week course with him. I, was, I actually got introduced to him from uh, Lindley of the Trading Nut podcast. So Lindley was on here talking about cryptos not so long ago. Now, Lindley was the one that introduced me to Hishu Han and said, hey, look, this guy is taking, I've seen him take a $1,000 account to 100000 and he seems to sort of do it with, with regular ease. Uh, I did the three-week training with him and saw him take like a $50 account up to uh, $24,000, $25,000. A lot of it was to do with psychology, like 90, 90% of it to, was to do with psychology around how he did it. But anyway, what uh, what drove this second interview that I did with him was what he said at the end of the very first interview, which was episode 14 of the of the 52 Traders podcast. And he said, look, I'm going to leave you with one thing. Go and look up Volume Spread Analysis, or VSA. So I immediately went and looked looked it up, researched it, read a, an ebook on it, and, and I knocked around for probably, I don't know, it would have, would have been a few weeks before it just got the better of me. I'm like, I've got to get this guy back on to find out exactly what he was going to, you know, what, what has he got to say about volume spread analysis? So we dive deep into it with Hishu Han in this episode coming up in just a second. Uh, what he's doing now, I've got no idea. I haven't heard from him for ages, so I don't, if he, I, still, I don't even know if he's still knocking around the traps. Maybe this will unearth him somewhere or somehow. But guys, so this... Is going to be a beauty. I know you're going to love it. This guy knows his stuff big time around the markets. So um, you can look forward to that. Now, before we get into the show, there was something that I wanted to just drop here. Uh, like this weekend, I've managed to catch up with an old friend who came over from the States. And he brought with him uh, a guy that I played football with years ago. I was like 19. He was 28, 29 maybe. And this guy's gone on to, to become a multimillionaire after being a salesman back then and uh, and now very, very successful businessman. Um, and we, we are having a chat in the uh, in the pub. We're talking about trading, which is, you know, a rarity. So somebody with, with money is obviously interested in trading, <laughs> whereas a lot of other people I talk to aren't. Uh, and, well, they don't talk about it. Anyway, this guy was a multimillionaire. It's not like the first multimillionaire I've spoken to. I mean, I, I speak to a lot of them on the show here. Now, what was there was one thing that he did tell me, and we were in sort of a, a, a drunken stupor at the time, but one bit of advice which really I think might help everyone out here in terms of turning off the ego, okay? So one of the one bit of advice he gave me, so he just he sort of said it like I was talking about trading and he he just said, he goes, "Whatever you do, don't tell anyone what you earn." And I'm like, really? He goes, yep, don't ever mention what you earn. I was like, why is that? He goes, it's it's ego. It's your ego. You're just feeding your ego, and it's going to trip you up somewhere, somewhere along the way. So just don't talk about what you earn when you're trading. So if that helps someone out there listening, I hope it does. If it stops you from, like, if you're doing, if you're trading and you're wanting to, 
be successful so that you can go out to your mates and go, hey, look, I've just bought this, you know, flash car because I'm trading and I made, you know, 30 grand this month um, in about five hours worth of work or something like that, then let this be a word of warning, okay? So think about it. Don't tell anyone or don't even think that that's what you're going to do if you become successful at trading. This this is, it's got to be, uh, it's got to be kept on the lowdown. Um, look, tell me if you want. Send me an email. Let me know if you're successful. I don't know. Just just whatever you do, get it out of your mind. That's what I'm trying to do. That's what I'm doing um, as we speak uh, and going forward in the future. So hopefully that helps someone out there listening. And um, yeah, what else can I say? Look, I think let's just get on with the show. I've, I've actually I hunted through all my notes in that and uh, old stuff that I've, I've I had here and I found I was actually searching for Hishu Han and I, I found a screenshot which actually sort of demonstrates, uh, what does it demonstrate? It demonstrates the fact that he's trading a real account. It demonstrates, a, this was what a screenshot I'd taken whilst I was doing this three-week course. And uh, and you can see how how some of these trades are, are, are coming about. Okay, so it's some good proof. It's some good proof. I'll chuck that up, in the, up there in the show notes. And I might even, because I did have a couple of little videos that I shot with him, I might even be able to release some of that um, or just a small chunk of those videos up on the YouTube. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. But um, for now, enjoy the podcast. I know you're going to get some value out of this. It's a doozy. All right, let's do it. Can you tell myself and my listeners why you thought it was so important to read up on uh, VSA theory? Uh, because VSA actually has two components. First, like you say, the volume. Second, the spread. Why do we want to read both the volume and the spread? Or rather, why would we want to incorporate the coefficient between volume and spread? Primary reason is because we want to identify true price breakouts from false ones. Frequently, a lot of traders will be using support and resistance. I'm sure you know that. And they will meet up with places where the prices are so ambiguous it could be going up bouncing off the support, for example, or it could be breaking down the support and becoming a complete true breakout. And even within a breakout, how many pips will you go? How far will you go? How many ticks will you go? Will you go enough to make money? Or are you just getting into another bad trade because of false breakout? Volume spread analysis answers that question perfectly. First, we know, uh, let me take in the context of, let's say, the forex market, right? In the forex market, there is no centralized volume because it is an OTC, over-the-counter, uh, traded predominantly by seven or eight large banks and the other 100 over liquidity providers. So, But still, volume is one of the key driving factors of prices. Another key driving factor of price is the level of desperation, which is reflected in the spread. So let me give you an example. In the first example, I say volume is important because this is this is this is intuitive. So let's say we have like one thousand people trying to buy an apple at one dollar because of the massive amount of buying volume. The nap, the price of apple naturally will go up, right? That's very intuitive. But think of it in another way. What if one person was desperate enough to offer to buy the apple at ten thousand dollars? you will still cause the price of the apple to go up because whenever someone beats a price, someone asks a price, it will match. So in the first one volume, we talk about whether there is actual buying and selling in the market. And number two, the spread will actually tell you the level of desperation that is going to happen in the market. If you have a case where both the volume, the actual act of buying and selling, matches with, coincides with a case where people are desperate to continually bid for higher prices or lower prices, that will be a very strong move and that will identify you a real breakout. And if you have one out of the two, maybe a real breakout. But if you have neither, neither a good volume nor a good spread, which indicates that there's no level of desperation, it's just normal market noise, most probably you have a false breakout. Avoid that trade. Yes, basically that's okay. It. So, um, so when you when you were talking about you know go up, have a look at the theory, but 
um, don't use volume yeah. spread analysis. And I suppose you're talking about the um, right. Richard Wyckoff's uh, work there. What, what did you mean by that <laughs> yes. particular statement? Because the problem is, if you are trading some markets, OTC markets like Forex, for example, there is no centralized <clears throat> data, accurate data for volume. Even if you're using uh, institutional platforms such as EBS or Reuters 3000, you don't really get accurate uh, data. So, and another another problem is that another problem is that okay, the traditional VSA analysis has a few contradictory scenarios. Let me give you an example. Uh, according to the Richard Wickoff method, right? <clears throat> if you see that the distance between the open high low close is huge. There is actually a very large spread in the bar, right? And the volume is high. It could mean two things. Number one, it could mean that, for example, if the price is a bullish bar, the buying volume has increased. Or it could also mean that this is the last pair of buying volume from the last remaining group of buyers before it's exhausted and comes down. My experience is that most traders have a hard time understanding this, especially in, in pertaining to the field of Forex because they have never worked in a bank before. They have never been in a, they have never dealt with a two-way price uh, market making or interbank dealing before. So they do not really know whether is it an exhaustive buy, which they should not long, or is a start of a buying spur, which they should long. So, but knowing the principles behind it, will help you greatly to identify which levels in these prices are critical, are significant, and more importantly, is reflexive, which comes from the theory of reflexivity by George Soros, where it says, in simplified terms, function of X leads to function of Y, where X is cognition, how the people look at a market, how they see the prices, and Y is reaction. It means at certain prices, they are more sensitive. They will act on it. For example, like in the, in the simplest term, a support and resistance area is a reflexive area because especially like a big round number, a whole number like 1.1, 1.2, stuff like that. Because <clears throat> these are areas that has been previously heavily contested by both buyers and sellers. The memory still lingers in them. And when it comes back to that area, there is another competition. When the spread widens, and momentum increases, most likely it's going to break out in a direction or so. Yeah. So you don't really need to, you don't apply the VSA strictly as the, the, the traditional Richard Wickoff method. But if you understand the principles of it, you will know which level you want to be trading off to buy or to sell. So, so you're saying that looking at the support and resistance is pretty much key to having success with VSA or that type of trading? I wouldn't say support and resistance because support and resistance is classically defined by two points that has been bounced off, either a bottom yep. or a top, correct? So what I'm talking about is heavily contested areas that if you're experienced enough, you can see visually, or if you're not experienced enough, you could use a concept called Markovian chains. Basically, it's a stochastical process where it says that if a price is not transient, it is recurrent. Meaning to say that, uh, according to a lot of like, like um, think of it like a, a random data plot on a graph paper, right? So you curve fit like linear regression, you have one line. Then that is actually the recurrent zone where price keeps touching and keeps going. It can be a support or resistance zone. It can be not a support or resistance zone. Doesn't matter. So you don't really need two points to connect them. Then, if the price were to go out of that zone, which usually is shown by a strong volume spread move with momentum, then it's actually going into what we call a transient zone, where a transient zone is where price is transient and not necessarily, usually do not come back to the recurrent zone again. Also known as a breakout, also known as start of a trend. Okay? And so the um, so, so what you're talking about there was, was that the accumulation and decumulation phase of a volume spread analysis um, type move or type theory? So... Uh, no. no, not at all. I'm not, I'm, I'm not talking about accumulation. I'm not talking about AD, no. accumulation distribution. 
because we are not talking about the stock market. Um, let's say you are looking at a futures market or the forex market or even the commodities market or bond market, whatever it is, right? The the thing is, there are certain because especially in a continual market like the forex market, which does not stop a week uh, at all, there are certain points that has recurred being competed over and over and over and over again in a price and you may see it to be a support and resistance sometimes but if the range is rather huge you may not be able to see it uh, you want to know if you want to see it visually you will need someone to train you because it takes some time quite a long time or if you're mathematically inclined, you will need to program something called a Markov chain, also known as stochastical Brownian motion. And yes. how do you spell that? Markov so, chain. M R K O V Markov chains. Yeah, it's a statistical tool. You usually what I do is that I analyze that a lot on like MATLAB. Uh, and some of the statistical, statistical software like IBM SPSS. It, it can be pretty useful in conjunction with the one of the topics that I talked before, right? Uh, yep. ARIMA, remember? Yeah, which, which really is just variancy. So the essence of how I use VSA is like that. I start, I start by collecting data from, let's like, say, a recent market window, say about uh, two, three hours of market data. Let's say if you're using like 15 minute chart you probably will collect like half a day and you have enough data window then you need to plot out this uh, linear regression of where the market is going generally and then the Markov chains will actually tell you that there are certain places that are recurrent and there are certain places that are not recurrent so when every mile points in one direction in at a recurrent area goes beyond the recurrent area and the spread widens up of the bar. I'm not talking about a beat up spread. I'm talking about spread of the bar, yeah. open, high, low, close, together with uh, increase in momentum, also known as uh, rate of change. Then the chances that is actually a real breakout is extremely high. Of course, after you enter the trade, you will need a very sound, solid money management. You can still lose, of course. So you need a very good money management in order to uh, reduce your losses and therefore net an edge over time. Yes. Okay. And would you say would you say you use uh, this sort of theory in most of your trading systems, or if not all of them? Uh, no. It depends on it depends on how you want to trade it because I'm trained both in fundamentals, uh, namely the discipline of global macro. I'm also trained in technical trading. I am referring to technical trading in this case, where you will usually be doing a faster entry and faster exit. Could be intraday, could be like one or two days or three days, or intra interweek. Um, seldom, you should really not apply Markov chains and all these things on a very long-term basis, like weekly or monthly charts, or even daily charts, because Stochastical processes are like, um, imagine there is a box, right? There is a box, there's a paper box. You put in a particle gun and you shoot a stream of particles onto the box. Some of them will reflect. Some of them will refract. That so means some of them will bounce off at different angles along the boxes yep. nonstop, right? So the Markov chain the stochastical process only tells you that there's a very short term, re, re, there's a short term repeatable patterns that's going to occur. In the long run, nobody knows exactly what is going on. So there's actually the random walk theory, the Brownian motion. But in the very short term, the stochastical process actually tells you that there's a very high probability that certain small patterns will repeat. And these patterns will just occur on the start of a breakout. So our job is to identify which one is the highest probability and then trade on those real breakouts, which is before the price move. And therefore, if the market is consolidating, we may lose a bit or take a small profit. If the market is starting to trend, 
you're in for a very good ride. And um, and so, have you incorporated this this whole sort of theory into any, um, I suppose, custom indicators or, or tools that you use with your trading? No, I do not program this into custom. There, are, I, I have some tools that can help you identify those. But my focus, for example, when I'm training people from the universities or any individuals that come to me, is I want to. I want them to ingrain this philosophy behind, have a complete understanding of this this mechanics and be able to visually identify. Because why do I not want to put it in the indicator alone is because platforms change all the time, technology change all the time. And also the one of the reasons is what if one day I'm dead? And no and no and nobody can update them the software anymore. They must my students must have the skill to carry on this for the rest of their lives. So I, I need to teach them the philosophy, the mechanics, the theory, and how it looks like in the real world over and over and over and over again until they close their eyes when they hear the sound of the bell. They even know that, yep. that kind of thing. Yeah, then they'll be very good. They'll be very, very good. And yeah. in, in terms of if, if they wanted to sort of get a head start and um, and just start looking into this sort of stuff, what, what would you recommend be your, your first port of call to... Is there a book or is there an online resource or something that they could you could you could look up on Google to try and find out more information? What would what would that look like? Read about Markov chains. Read about path dependency. And read about stochastical processes. Okay, cool, and very. very Topic, yes. and, and another question I wanted to ask you was, um, so I, I sort of saw some similarities, uh, rightly or wrongly, uh, between another guest I had on, uh, Peter Davies, who was an order flow, order flow trader for the uh, E-mini and S&P. Mm-hmm. And I started, I mean, mm-hmm. after reading up on VSA, I sort of thought, oh, look, is there some sort of commonalities here between order flow and, and VSA? I mean, they both based on volume. Um, what are your thoughts on, on order flow and how that sort of is related to this? Order flow is actually one of the most superb tools if you want to trade the futures market or even the stock market. It's a very... It's a, it's a, it's a tool of the dying breed uh, coming from the as a trader myself. Um, it's very hard to find people who are good at it, so... <laughs> Uh, but they do. It, it does share similarities to VSA, uh, except for the fact that VSA is much more visual because you do need to look at the length of the spread, which is also the which is the relative position of the open, high, low, and close of the bar. Whereas order flow is more looking for large orders, block what we call block trades, being triggered at certain prices and trying to piggyback on the big orders while the market moves. So I would say the order flow is an even shorter term variation of VSA and a less visual way of doing VSA. Cool. Yeah. Okay. And if, if there was something, yeah. if there was anything else that I suppose I haven't asked today around VSA and and how that and your thoughts on on the whole um, volume spread analysis theory and yeah. and also I suppose the Markov chains, what what would that be? What yes. what, have, what haven't you told us today? I think this is a very good start. If if you there are there are further advanced more advanced topics on, to cover on this, but uh, if you want to get started on knowing reflexive areas, recurrent areas, transient areas, you want to know we want to be able to identify at least for a start which VSA is more reliable and which is not. You want to be able to identify which breakout from support resistance is real and which is not then just simply focus on the three things that I recommend you to read, which is number one, Markov chains. Number two, path dependency theory. Number three, stochastical processes. These three is really quite challenging. But if you actually read those and master them, or like I said again, if you do need help to get it done on a faster scale, you can always come to me for mentorship. Then... Yeah, you should be on a very, okay. very... And my start. last question for you today, and thank you very much for the time, um, is, so so the, so the system you gave me to, to try and, and to trade a couple of months ago now, and obviously mm. I just mentioned before, it didn't um, work out for me, but um, now, so mm. that system, was 
was that based on in any way shape or form uh, the vsa theory and or the way you trade it was that based on vsa in any way i mean when you're looking at the markets and looking at the indicators did you did you were you looking at that sort of those levels that the uh, markov chains and, and that sort of thing were they when I trade the market, yes, on, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm on a technical trading, let's say I want to do intraday trading, yes, I definitely have to look at all of those. The indicators that I send you actually is just a portion, a simplified version of what I do. That indicator actually measures DYDX, which is known as rate of change. And rate of change is a much more reliable divergence indicator than, say, stochastics. RSI, CCI, MACD, blah, 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 you know. So, so that is actually a much simplified version of that. But it is definitely part and parcel of my entire technical trading system, which I would say VSA-derived theories takes about 60% of the weightage at least. Cool. Yeah. Well, look, um, thanks for coming on the show yeah. again, Hishuan. It's been an absolute pleasure. And yeah. I'm sure the guys have got, yeah. uh, the listeners out there have got some great insights and can go off and, and check out those resources. I'll include them in the show notes so that people can pick them up at the end. Sure. Um, and uh, and thank you very much. And look, if, if anyone's got any questions out there, are you happy to answer them if um, if I get them to come via me and uh, and I can pass them on to you? Sure, 24 Brilliant. hours a day. Okay, all right. Well, thank you, Hishu Han. And, um, and I'll give yeah. the rest of my uh, August trading update shortly. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed that show, that rerun with Hishu Han. Uh, whether we get him on the show in the future, I don't know. I've completely lost touch with the guy. But let's see, maybe this will unearth him. Who knows? Now, I'll try and get some sort of video up on the YouTube channel, make sure it's going to be top quality, something that you can really sink your teeth into, something you've probably never seen before. Let's see if I can pull that together this week. Uh, now, the I've actually put, and made it a bit more prominent, the link to the Telegram chat, which seems to be getting some momentum now. There's quite a few guys on there having, a, having conversations with each other about trading helping themselves out um, really good stuff that I've seen on the channel there in the last week or so so guys if you want to join that it's free to join it's on tradingnut.com there's a link to it it's called it's on the telegram app so you can have it on your phone desktop webs uh, on the web whatever you want to however you want to consume it it's just if you don't know telegram you should be on it as a trader anyway there's some great resources and other chat rooms on there as well now um, what else can I tell you Oh look, the Robot Traders Club. Uh, we're releasing. I'll be releasing another robot into the lab in the coming uh, week or so. Now this one's looking pretty pretty good. It unfortunately, wasn't provided by one of the members who who've joined. And if you don't know, if you're not a member yet, if you've got a strategy and let's just let's be honest, if you've got a strategy and you can't be bothered back testing it and it's fairly mechanical, then join the Robot Traders Club for seven bucks. Submit your strategy. I'll go and, and build it, automate it, upload it into the lab, and we can all have a look and see if it's going to work or not. How, how much time is that going to save you? I don't know. I expect it will save you hours and hours of actually going through a chart and seeing if it works manually. Let's just automate the thing and, and whip it out and see what happens. So, guys, uh, that's how the Robot Trader Cl Traders Club works. Works Either you submit the strategies or I find the strategies. We build the robots. We see if they work. And then if they do, then we push them forward and maybe tweak, adjust, and use some of the 40-plus settings we can adapt to make these th make these things fly. So, guys, uh, yeah, Robot Traders Club. And if you want to build your own robots, I should really mention this. We've got the Robot Builders Club as well, which is a, a way to build your own strategy. So if you don't want it to be public, if you just want it to be, you want to have the skills of building your own robot, you want it to be private, you want to be able to build it yourself or build any of these robots yourself, you want to be able to not have to wait for me to build them, you want to just have the autonomy, then I recommend checking it out. Twenty. I've done a course which takes 21 days to take you from somebody who can't build a trading ro robot to somebody who can build one that can do virtually anything. Okay, Any strategy you want to build, I guarantee you'll be able to do it by the end of the course. Um, right, so let me not go on about that anymore. If you want to check those out, they're on the Trading Up website along with that chat room. And um, I've got some episodes coming up in the future, so please stay tuned for those. In the meantime, have a great trading week, and I'll see you in the markets.